<laughs> so I work at LinkedIn, and uh, I'm a machine learning researcher. Um, and we use uh, machine learning, thank you, to uh, leverage the behavior and relationships of hundreds of millions of people uh, that engage uh, with the product to make the world's professionals more successful and productive. Um, and the premise of our work is that there is this uh, friction in the market for talent and opportunity and the transaction costs of finding um, the right opportunity when you have a certain set of skills and an educational background is very high. And with LinkedIn and the power of machine learning technology, I think we can um, pull some of that friction from this market. And so this talk will be uh, structured into two primary pieces. The first will be um, a series of uh, stories about the way that new data sources are creating new markets. And I think uh, LinkedIn is an example of a, a new data source, um, but I think that there are some others that are, are especially interesting. And I want to talk about the ways that technology is changing how easy it is to measure and instrument things that have historically been very, very expensive or even impossible uh, to observe. And so uh, the second piece will be uh, two case studies um, in how we might take a, a novel data source and extract actionable uh, business intelligence uh, from that signal. So my background uh, is in a field called complex systems analysis. And a complex system is one whose uh, behavior in the aggregate is different and not characterized by the uh, behavior of the individual components of the system. Um, and you, you see these emergent phenomena. Here's the vascular structure of this leaf. Each cell, um, if you knew everything there was to know about the cell of this leaf, you would not be able to foresee the venous structure. Um, and if, if you hold in your mind uh, the image of a, a very large flock of birds as they move and swarm, or a school of fish, if you've ever been snorkeling um, or, or scuba diving, the way that it shimmers and has this transcendental, um, otherworldly beauty, um, Many systems exhibit these properties at the macroscopic scale, uh, which by their nature are unobservable to human agents um, operating in this very locally constrained way. You're only able to see uh, the area around you. And so just like birds, as we are animals, and just like hives of bees and colonies of ants, uh, very large groups of people uh, exhibit these kinds of patterns. If you've ever stood on top of a tall building, I mean, at a concert, you, you can see this likewise. Um, or in Tokyo, as people cross the, uh, in the crosswalk in Shibuya, you see these uh, people moving like fluids. And when we interact with technology, we create this digital trace data that allows us to study these patterns from a faraway perspective. And we can understand phenomena that unfold uh, in space and time um, in the same way that we study the cell. And we can uh, take this lens on human behavior. And so here we have uh, traffic flows in Lisbon, Portugal. And this is pulled off of the GPS units in taxi cabs. And the structure of the city emerges from these GPS points. And the breadth of a line here is the number of tick cabs traveling along this, this path. And the color is the speed, uh, represents the speed. And so in, in the bottom right, you can see the structure of the old city and, and the modern thoroughfares. And information like this can help to inform uh, the design of uh, urban planning. Um, you, can, you can begin to understand where, where gridlock is, is especially important um, in a way that uh, estimates taken off of individual intersections does not reveal. And so. Uh, for very low cost, just pulling the, the time series off of these GPS units, you're able to reconstruct the flows of the city and understand a phenomenon that unfolds um, over many months and weeks. So there, is, uh, there are a couple companies in uh, the valley that are um, creating totally new markets um, with their data. And um, one of the two of the most exciting are Planet Labs and Skybox. And these are companies that have just launched satellites that um, provide an API onto the surface of the Earth. And the notion is that you can bid on imaging time on these geostationary satellites. And if you need the image in three weeks, you will pay less than if you need the image in one month. 
And this model, this, this payment model, is similar to that of cloud computing, where instead of having to buy a $500,000 500, um, grid computing platform, you can pay for $180 of compute time on Amazon Elastic Cloud Compute um, and use this sharing model uh, to have access to the data that you need. And so the question that this raises is, what, uh, how does this change geopolitics when we have um, multiple images a day um, of Syria available for free on the internet? Um, how does that change the calculus of the movement of um, troops or uh, you consider you know, the demilitarized zone in North Korea um, or nuclear facilities? If we open source the surface of the earth, this changes the calculus um, in making decisions about how uh, uh, governments operate. Likewise, the study of climate change. If we can look at glacial growth and recession or deforestation in South America, we can better understand and study the planet. And using machine learning technology, we can begin to extract patterns in this data that can inform our policy making for years to come. And so I think humanity is at a, uh, I mean, we, uh, this is obviously nothing, nothing new. Like the next 50 and 100 years are crucial um, for the survival of our species. And it, it relates in large measure to whether we can rise to meet the challenge of resource management, um, specifically with respect to clean water and food. And um, so historically, in the early 1900s, there was um, great concern that the world's population was growing so quickly that we would not be able to feed everyone. And uh, we knew that nitrogen was an especially effective way to make plants grow. And the air is full of nitrogen, but it's not bioavailable. Um, and so there was much discussion about whether we were going to have mass extinctions and famines um, as, as hum humanity continued to grow. And technology rose to meet the challenge in the development of uh, ammonia fertilizer. We, we discovered a reaction that allows us to fix nitrogen from the air with hydrogen and create massive volumes of fertilizer that allowed us to 10x our ability to produce, produce food. And it's my hope that intelligent data management and um, deeper understanding of the behavior of, of these systems will allow us to more efficiently manage our resources. There are um, tractors now that till the soil. And in addition to tilling the soil, at fixed intervals, they take measurements of the chemical composition of the soil. And they tag these with GPS coordinates. So now farmers have a matrix of the different uh, chemical, comp the composition of their fields. And for individual farmers, this can inform decisions about what plants to, what crops to plant, um, and how uh, their, the, which parts of their field will be better uh, suited to different kinds of crops. And if you aggregate across different farm, uh, across different farms, you can begin to see um, how year to year uh, crop rotation affects the soil. And the, you can aggregate this data together to intelligently make decisions um, to squeeze as much value from the very finite natural resources we have available while having as little negative impact on the environment as possible. And so I think that these are some of the ways that we may leverage technology to um, address some of these very serious problems. Um, so these are on one end of the spectrum. We have satellites and tractors and, and infrastructure-based um, data signals. Um, and on the other end are uh, our mobile phones, and the, the, the rise of ubiquitous computing, these low-cost distributed sensor networks that instrument um, every action. And so one, I mean, mobile obviously is, is the uh, canonical example of this, but as we begin to see um, everything uh, acting as a computer, I, I, this creates new possibilities. And one of these is the way that Disney has begun to dis deploy wristbands RFID, or rather low-energy low Bluetooth wristbands in their parks. And so instead of waiting in line for a ride, you badge in, and it gives you a time at which to come back. In addition, this wristband is your hotel room key and your credit card inside the park. So this creates uh, a much more fluid uh, experience for the customer. Um, and for Disney, it creates the opportunity to understand. So this is a satellite photo of Epcot Center. And imagine uh, the flow of people here as though ants on the surface of a table. Um, you can study 
the trajectories of families through the park and begin to understand what kinds of experiences lead people to leave early and what kinds of experiences lead people to stay and create that magic. Um, if uh, a, a family exhibits a particular predisposition to Buzz Lightyear, you can instrument experiences that seem organic but are tailored to each individual in the park. And so in the way that with consumer web technologies, we can do A-B testing, where you take one configuration of the web page and another configure of the way, configuration of the web page and compare how large groups of people respond to these uh, different configurations. Disney is now in a position to, on one day, have the park running a certain way, and on the next day, run it a different way, run this out for a month, and see how this affects the flow of humans through this environment. It's, the, it's one of the world's largest sociological experimentation chambers. And it's the, the advent of this low-cost computer. This is basically disposable computing technology that is creating um, the ability to measure signals that have historically been um, impossible to capture. Um, I have a friend who founded a company called Sociometric Solutions in Boston out of the MIT Media Lab. And they they've, their product is a badge that acts as your employee badge. Um, and it opens doors at work for you and, and serves as identification. Um, but it also records, um, so in the same way that the Jawbone Up or the Nike, Fit, uh, Nike Fuel um, gives you analytics on your activity through the day, um, this provides analytics on your experience at work and how often you're in meetings, how often you're sitting, how often you're standing, um, who you're speaking with and for how long. Um, and this allows the individual to have, if you're taking measurements of how productive do I feel right now, let's say that your phone prompts you to say how happy are you, how fulfilled are you, how productive do you feel, you can then look at the patterns in your workday that help you feel uh, as productive as possible. And at an executive level, aggregating across all of your employees, if your marketing and sales department aren't speaking to one another, you can replay the past six months of professional interactions and try to understand who are the information brokers in this, in this system and debug your organization. So this in its own right is, is tremendously exciting technology. Um, but coming back to the theme of creative ways to measure the world um, and finding low-cost correlates of um, very expensive signals, as these are um, academic researchers by, by providence, um, they are able to do experiments that a, a typical organization might not, uh, it might not be in their top three priorities. And so what they've done is had uh, dozens of uh, experimental subjects uh, wear these badges all day long and every 15 minutes spit in a test tube. And what that saliva sample does is allow you to measure cortisol levels in the blood. And so cortisol is the stress hormone. They have found that there is a transform of, this, uh, of the tenor of your voice, not what you say, but rather how you sound, that is correlated quite strongly with the level of uh, cortisol in your bloodstream. So you can measure how stressed a person is. And this, this is a way to instrument something that has historically been, I mean, spitting in a test tube is a non-starter. Like, you, you know, I'm, I'm doing well to get my phone out of my pocket to tell you how happy I am. Um, but if you can instrument this kind of signal and then correlate that um, with professional interactions, you can begin to try to understand where the pockets of stress are in your organization and proactively manage those kinds of experiences. Um, how am I doing on time? 15 minutes, all right. Um, yeah, let's, let's do it. Um, so this is, I don't know if you're all familiar with Coursera, which is one of these massively online open courseware platforms that allows people to take courses from Stanford here, a machine learning course, um, for free, online. And so they have homework submissions, and you submit your uh, homework, and it, uh, it's programming. Uh, and so it passes unit tests, or it fails unit tests, which are saying this function performed as expected. The challenge here, however, is that this is not especially personalized feedback. You know that you did it incorrectly, but you don't necessarily know what was wrong with your submission. And so, undoubtedly, scaling up education to um, everybody on the planet for free is 
is it's just the thing to do. I mean, this is this is the future. The question is, how do we make it um, comparable with the real life, the real world experience of face-to-face -face, uh, feedback from a professor? And so, what the researchers at Stanford have done is taken the homework submissions and decomposed these programs into uh, an abstract syntax tree. And so, this is the logical structure, the fundamental logical structure of the program. And with two different trees. <laughs> you can define a similarity measure that says how similar are these two um, submissions. And you can uh, then lay out each, each point here is a homework submission, and how close they are is a, uh, is a function of how similar the two answers are. And you see that clusters emerge. And anybody who's done grading uh, in, in any kind of course knows that people tend to get the answer wrong in the same ways, and they tend to get the answer right in the same ways, and that there are many ways, ways to solve the problem, um, but they are finite. It's not, not everyone is a unique and beautiful snowflake, and so what you can do is you can cluster this network into eight or ten dominant components and provide customized feedback to that way of answering the homework and scale out this personalized feedback to tens of thousands of individuals. And so this, I think, is, is the next 50 years. This represents the next 50 years of computing. What, as computing uh, becomes available to the next 4 billion people on the planet, um, how we use it and what it means for their day-to-day -day lives as they live them, um, I think, is a, is a make or break question for society. And so I think that technologies like this, low-cost computing technologies that help people make um, better decisions and access information that is relevant and vital to the, the problems that they face, that this is the um, essential problem. And I mean, to be clear, like the, the addressable market opportunity. Four billion people um, that have not, been, you know, that are not broadband, you know, don't have access to broadband. That, that's the market. Um, and I think the technologies um, like Premise, which, so Premise Data Corporation, is a company that is building out a workforce of annotators who use an app on their mobile phone to take photographs and record in marketplaces and record the quantity, price, and quality of goods in urban city centers all over the world. And as they scale up, this will become um, every city and every market will have real-time information about how much goods of all, manner, of all, all, man, uh, all shape and size cost. And this allows us to create a real-time consumer price index for the surface of the earth. And if you think about an efficient, uh, an efficient market, um, when people can begin to understand where to buy and sell their goods right now, uh, this creates a lot of economic opportunity. Um, I think in many developing countries, um, farmers and basically people who sell physical goods um, often live far from urban city centers, and so there's a, a role for an intermediary who will come to small towns and say, I will buy this unit of product from you um, for this much. But these prices that are available, that are on offer in the urban city centers fluctuate with the global uh, markets. And that information is not available to the individual producer. And so often these people are having to take this intermediary at his or her word um, with respect to how much the, the good is actually worth. And you don't know when they'll be back. It may be two weeks and you might need the money now. And if we can get them access to how much this you know, 200 kilo bundle of wool is actually worth, this creates um, a much more efficient uh, market. And so the way that we use technology to serve those who have previously um, not been part of the core audience for uh, technological solutions to societal problems, um, this, this is going to shape the character of the next 50 years. So these are some of the ways that I think new data sources are creating um, opportunities for understanding and allowing us to study the structure of society as it evolves in time. Um, and now I want to touch on two um, specific applications uh, and, and, and kind of walk through how we think about uh, harnessing these data sources. So this is a project that I worked on during my PhD um, that focuses on Twitter. And so this is as fundamental a revolution as anything in the past hundred years. The notion that um, historically you had to have access to capital to 
uh, create content. You had to have a satellite or a broadcast television station. Um, and this broadcast model of communication characterized information production for the past 50 years. And then we saw the emergence of networked communication with many content creators and consumers. Um, and this has had a fundamental transformative effect on the shape of the public sphere and political communication. And so my PhD research was concerned with um, the early detection of propaganda campaigns. You can have multiple accounts controlled by a central um, organization or corporation or government trying to create the illusion of consensus. And so from the Twitter data source, we would extract memes and visualize their evolution in time and also their network structure. And so here each point is a person and a line is drawn between the points if they interact. It's orange if I mention you and blue if I retweet you. Here we have the White House and on the right we have a meme for promoting a club night at a, a, a rather a nightclub um, in the US. And these two communication networks have very different structure. On the left, we have this organic, uh, messy communication structure. And on the right, we have a very regular network with these fans um, targeting multiple individuals. And, and in addition to spamming these people, they are also pretending to speak with one another to create the appearance of um, consensus around this issue. And so you can imagine that we can take this kind of insight and begin to define statistics for example, how many people on average does a person talk to in this network and that, that will separate these two classes of communication and monitor the feed to identify proactively the development of these propaganda campaigns. And so information visualization was a central part of this infrastructure. From the start, we had this website that uh, visualized the networks for everything that came through the pipeline. And in addition to identifying uh, features that might help us tell these two types of communication apart, another pattern emerged. And so here we're focusing on American political communication. And as you know, uh, in America, as you may know, in America we have uh, two parties that uh, don't always seem to speak with one another as effectively as they might otherwise. Um, and we see online, with respect to American political communication, this bi-clustered structure in these communication networks. And these are for many different memes. And as this information flowed through our data processing pipeline and we were visualizing it, this pattern emerged. We were not looking for this, but this core insight um, struck us. And when you aggregate across all political communication, you see the uh, partisan spectrum shake out in these communication networks. And we can build network clustering algorithms that will identify these communities. And we have, so we have two communities of left and right leaning political actors who are preferentially rebroadcasting content that reflects their own ideological view and engaging across the partisan divide in the form of these mentions. It's basically uh, partisan flame baiting. And it, it's characteristic of some of the dysfunction that we see um, in American political dialogue. And what this buys you, in addition to um, insights sociologically into the structure of political communication is a classifier that can predict a person's political affiliation. And so now I can say, what are left-leaning Twitter users who have talked about gun control? Which, which candidates or issues do these people care about? And so this is a way that you can leverage the insights from visualization and machine learning technologies to um, instrument, you know, historically you have to go uh, you do a telephone survey. Um, this gives you a very cheap way to measure the sentiment of tens of thousands of people. And so I think that this is yet another example of um, a creative way to measure the world. At LinkedIn, uh, we, uh, our users share um, information about who they know and their professional relationships. We want to be the, uh, the definitive professional profile of record. And this means that we understand um, the temporally evolving structure of the economy with respect to the skills that people have. Five minutes? Um, yeah. All right, that's perfect. Um, we know who you know. Uh, we know where you went to school. We know what companies you've worked for, the skills that you have, where you volunteer. Um, and who you've, uh, you, I mean, we, there are signals that are interesting, right? We can, we can say how many times has this person viewed this other person's profile? 
And that tells us something about the character of that relationship. And so you might imagine, this is, this is a snapshot of my professional network, and we see that it has this, this clustering structure. And these are different groups of people from different times in my life. And you can imagine, so I don't know if any of you are familiar with the Crunchbase data set, which tracks venture capital funding. Um, you could imagine that taking uh, snapshots of the network of founders when they start a company, um, that successful companies might have a certain character to their first degree professional networks. Are, people, are they people who span multiple disconnected communities and have this opportunity? Are you in biology and computing? You know, what, what is the characteristic of a successful uh, founder network? Um, these are the kinds of questions that the, the data allows us to begin to ask. Um, and so the way that we do this is using machine learning technology. And I mean, it's a very deep, deep subject. Um, but the, the principal concept is that you can take each person as a point and plot them here with respect to the number of connections they have and on the Y um, with respect to their page rank in the endorsements network. And we can see if we have two groups of people, experts and non-experts, with respect to a given skill, that with respect to the connections, they are not well separated. But if we think about your page rank, these two groups can be distinguished somewhat. And so if we take 10 or 20 features of this nature, we can define um, basically a line in high dimensional space, it becomes a plane, that separates these two classes and make predictions about which, which a person belongs to. And so there are a broad set of problems that fulfill this character. I'll, I'll skip this piece. Um, whether or not a person is going to watch a movie. You know, is this movie one that you will watch or that you won't? Um, is this article one that you will read or won't? Um, is this a job that you would apply to? Uh, separating uh, classes of, of um, Casting the world's problems in, in these terms allows us to leverage the power of statistical computing to make these predictions and, and uh, automate work that uh, is very tedious um, at scale. And so the, there's, there's one class of problem solving, which is um, data applications. Which job are you going to click on? Um, what content will you share? Uh, what skills do you have? The second class, and I think that this is also that this is as powerful, if not more so, is that of the data platform. Um, so instead of a targeted application that solves a specific problem, thinking about um, technology that can be leveraged by multiple different applications, for example, a description of the topics that a person is interested in, or the kinds of movies that this person likes to watch, or how well two people know one another. These are data products that can be woven into multiple different outlets. Um, and in their, their strength is that they are generic enough to be applied in multiple different contexts. And this is how I try to think about machine learning technologies and taking these data sources um, and creating platforms that power uh, product ecosystems throughout the, uh, throughout the site. And so we see here um, a picture of a world uh, developing I mean, and it's happening right now, and in the next five years, um, as we have wearable computing uh, make its entrance onto the world stage and distributed sensor networks um, of computers that interact with one another through standardized APIs, um, we are going to see a transformation as fundamental, I think, as um, the development of the web browser. Um, and the question for entrepreneurs will be, how can we leverage this to understand the structure of society and uh, technological infrastructure like the electrical grid or the water supply chain or um, the farming ecosystem uh, in a way that creates value and uh, opportunity for the next four billion people on the planet. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Mike. Mm -hmm. um, we can take some questions from uh, the audience. But first, I have one my personal question. Um, with all this capacity and data, sorry, you need some water. <laughs> I do need some yeah. water. <laughs> yes. Um, and from the perspective of the user of the LinkedIn, ourself, yeah. um, what kind of benefits will all this capacity you have within LinkedIn? Mm -hmm 
be to our advantage? Right. And what's the next step in the development of LinkedIn? So I think, I mean, this is an excellent question. Um, I think on a first order, so I uh, actively manage my professional network, and I think a lot of people in this room are in a, a similar situation. And, um, right now, I think a lot of the value that LinkedIn provides is the ability to have visibility into uh, the people that, sort of like Facebook, makes it very easy to uh, maintain weak connections to people you knew tens of years ago. Um, information flows over, you know, the people that you see every day are very rarely the people with new information. You're all exposed to the same signals. Um, and where I think uh, we provide a lot of value is, is in maintaining those weak connections over time so that when you're in Boston, for example, you land in Logan International Airport, you can say, who do I know in Boston? I wanna, I wanna catch up on the tech scene here. And um, so as a way to track the development of your professional network in time, I think that's our first order value proposition right now. Um, with respect to where we're going, I think with all of this information, we can begin to help people understand their trajectory and next move going forward. So we, the census in the US has taken every 10 years. We have a real time snapshot of the job market. Um, and so we can help people say, what skills should I acquire this year to become employed in the next. Um, and so helping individuals understand the structure of the economy and the demand for talent as it develops in time um, and helping them connect with the educational opportunities to get the skills that they need to get that job, to level up their economic opportunity. I think that's the, the big vision. We have open questions. Anyone would like to Ask Mike the no one. Ah, come on. <laughs> this, one. Um, this might be a little bit too deep to answer quickly, but uh, how how generalizable are your uh, how how generalizable are your classification methods? So you showed a bunch of examples. Could you use similar algorithms across all of them, or are they very different? Or? So I think um, in general. So you'll hear a lot, you know, I think people hear a lot about machine learning, or at least as a hot technology, and I think the dirty secret is that the, the algorithms themselves are actually rather straightforward. Um, logistic regression is very, very popular. Um, the trick is in identifying the features. So these creative ways to measure the world, it's like how do I, let's say that I want to make a prediction as to how important someone is. You might look at just um, how many people they know. Well, like, well-connected people tend to be somewhat important. They've convinced a thousand people to connect with them on LinkedIn. The problem is that these people are off, that there are people who have a lot of connections who are, not, who are just active on LinkedIn. They're just super enthusiasts and they just have a lot of free time. And venture capitalists, there, there are very prominent venture capitalists in, uh, in Silicon Valley who do not uh, have very rich LinkedIn profiles because they're just busy. And so one way to um, measure this more precisely is to look at the ratio of how many times people view your profile relative to how many times you're on the site. And so it's sort of the return on investment. And so while the algorithms themselves, um, so it's sort of the 80-20 rule, right? Most, you know, 80% of the problems can be solved reasonably well with a, a small set of algorithms. There are the self-driving cars uh, that Google's developing, these are not driven by logistic regression. Um, and so there is a, a lot of opportunity for more sophisticated algorithms, but I think a lot of the creative work has to do with how well you measure the thing that you care about. More questions? I have one. Yep. Uh, let's assume I have a new company, a startup, and uh, I use a lot of data but I'm not sure how to leverage and use that data. What, what should I do? I think you start with the problem you're trying to solve. You know, this, it's sort of not an exciting answer, um, but you can spend, so it's important not to confuse work with progress. You can spend a lot of time cleaning and plotting and working with the data, um, but if you don't have a clarifying purpose throughout the exercise, I think that you can find yourself in a situation um, where you don't know anything new um, and you have exhausted countless hours just programming. 
And so I think um, identifying what do we, what are the three things that we care about most um, and trying to understand what your data might have to say about these things uh, is the first step. Um, there are technologies that make it very easy for non-technical users to engage with their data, and I think Tableau is an excellent example. There's a, a free public version for small data sets that will allow you to drag and drop um, features and look at the relationships and plot their evolution in time. And so um, before you hire a programmer, to try to you know, clean your data set, it may be worth just kicking the tires with a clear goal in mind. You know, I want to understand the relationship between Yelp scores and health inspection scores. You know, what, you know, what am I trying to prove here? That will help you, or rather, what am I trying to understand, not prove? That will help you. Um, there's a tool called Gephi that uh, allows you to understand the networks, uh, network structure, and this is an excellent tool for non- um, people who might not be statisticians or software engineers. Um, D3 is an excellent plotting tool. Um, yeah, I think tools like this that make this accessible to, to individuals are, are good places to start, but have a specific question in mind. Thank you. One question, Guy. Um, some people say that uh, data is the new oil uh, and in that regard, uh, LinkedIn sits on a rich oil field. Uh, what kind of data are you sharing with, with the wider community, uh, if any? And uh, yeah, Because as a startup, uh, sometimes it's hard to uh, get access to the data, even if you have the algorithms and you have uh, yeah. something in mind, the purpose. Um, so we make um, a lot of data about individual profiles available through our API. Um, we... Uh, I think it's a delicate, um, we take a very members first attitude towards um, how we treat our data and I think that there, um, you have to be delicate with people's personal information, especially as it relates to their professional um, development. And so I think um, to date we've taken a conservative approach with how much data we share about our users because you, you never want to surprise people. And so um, I think our API provides um, a reasonable lens on um, the individuals, uh, but in a, in a way that uh, preserves a member's ability to control what the broader internet has access to um, while balancing the, the need for a rich ecosystem of developers to, uh, to create tools and applications that leverage uh, the information about our, our, our member base. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys. <laughs>